Welcome and thank you for joining us to the Heart, Vascular and Thoracic Institute where today we have some experts with us who are going to talk about cardiac sarcoidosis. Now cardiac sarcoidosis, you may say, well, what is that? How can it affect me? What can I do to prevent it? There are so many questions and hopefully we're going to give you some of the answers today. So I'd like to introduce two of our experts. We have a pulmonologist, Dr. Manuel Ribeiro and a cardiologist, Dr. Ziad Taime. And they're gonna tell us a little bit about what their jobs involve and how they manage in a collaborative way, uh, cardiac sarcoidosis. My name's Christine Jealous. I'm also a cardiologist here in the HVTI of Cleveland Clinic. I'm an imaging cardiologist. So I have the pleasure of working with these gentlemen on a regular basis in our multidisciplinary team where we manage patients with cardiac sarcoidosis. So Manny, throwing across to you to start with, could you tell us a little bit about your role because you're the director of, of sarcoidosis and you manage patients with primarily pulmonary sarcoid, but we know a, a percentage of those patients go on to develop cardiac involvement. Correct, Chris. So, so first of all, thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure. And uh, yeah, so I'm a pulmonologist by training, uh, but the, the, the reason why I got involved into sarcoidosis is uh, uh, here we have a very large sarcoidosis center and uh, this was started many, many years ago by Dr. Dan Culver. And when I was training here many years ago during my pulmonary fellowship, I focused on uh, sarcoidosis in my last year of training. And the reason we do that is, you know, even though uh, sar sarcoidosis most of the time affects the lung, as you mentioned, uh, in a significant number of time, uh, other organs can be involved. And uh, our idea in our sarcoidosis center is to have one place for the patients to come and have their whole disease uh, taken care of. And uh, not only taking care of the pulmonary sarcoidosis, but also caring for the cardiac sarcoidosis or renal sarcoidosis. So every problem that they have related to this disease, we try to take care in this one center. So our role in the center is of course, a lot to manage the pulmonary side, but also to kind of coordinate uh, uh, this multidisciplinary care that, that we try to do. Perfect. Thank you, Manny. And I think that's one of the nice aspects to this centre is it really is multidisciplinary. Everyone plays to their strengths and hopefully with the patient always at the centre of the focus. So Zia, tell us a little bit about your role because you're an expert in heart failure and sarcoidosis affects patients across a breadth of, of, of different um, manifestations. And the sickest of our patients often present to your clinic. Do you mind telling us a little bit about what you do and how that benefits the team? And then I might throw back to Manny to give us a little bit more information on what sarcoidosis actually is. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having us here. Uh, so, in essence, sarcoidosis is multi-organ multi, uh, involvement. In other words, it affects multiple organs in the body. Uh, in up to 25% of the patients, they will get heart involvement of some, some sort. Could be mild, could be extensive. Up to 5% of patients, they get it clinically and they start feeling symptoms. One of the challenges that we have, sarcoidosis of the heart is the great masquerader. It can it can uh, deceive us in diagnosis, and oftentimes we get those patients really late in the game when they have sarcoidosis in their lungs for so many years, affects their heart, but goes undiagnosed for many years. And as we know, it is inflammation in the body. It inflames the heart, it causes problems. But if that inflammation is not really treated, it results in scarring and fibrosis of the heart. If you leave the fibrosis untreated for so many years, slowly it will change into a basically scarred dead, dead heart or dead myocardium. Give it time, it will become big, thin, and dilated, and that's where heart failure symptoms start to, to develop, where the, meet, the, the body needs are not met by the heart function, and it continues to slowly deteriorate, resulting in, in, in overt, overt heart failure. Unfortunately, we see it very common coming in our clinics, patients with severe heart failure, dilated heart, dilated myocardium, and they're coming for heart pump or heart transplant evaluation. And at the bottom of their past medical history, they have a diagnosis of sarcoidosis some 30 years ago that went to remission in the lungs, but it started to come back in the heart and went un undiagnosed. 
So our part here as, as a heart failure cardiologist really is to make sure that, the, first of all, the cardiac sarcoidosis is diagnosed early enough with high index of suspicion and comfort, and then treat it before it starts developing heart failure. But when it starts developing, to treat that as much as we're able to. In the, the most extreme cases, we go for, for heart pump or heart transplantation. Matter of fact, sarcoidosis was found in heart samples taken during pump implantation in more than three to four to five percent of patients that they were undiagnosed. Nobody knew they had sarcoidosis until we took that sample from their hearts. So I think it's fair to say awareness is key. So we need to uh, really review those histories well, people who perhaps had pulmonary sarcoidosis 20, 30 years ago, and make sure that we keep that on our radar when we're thinking about, well, why are they having cardiac problems now? And you mentioned some interesting statistics there that around 25% of people who have extra cardiac sarcoidosis will go on to have cardiac involvement. But I think it's really important for our audience that we be reassuring that that 25% is really um, what we see on autopsy studies and that of the 25%, only around 5% will actually manifest with uh, symptoms like heart failure, um, conduction problems, and so on during their lifetime. So Although we see a lot of this here at the clinic, it is relatively rare. And then that proportion who go on to develop heart failure or need transplantation is an even smaller proportion of that 5%. So we just want to make sure that we increase awareness of this condition so we can uh, diagnose this early in the piece, treat the inflammation, and then as you were talking about, Ziad, prevent the fibrosis that can lead to the long-term dysfunction. So Manny, when we come back to a more granular level, the question is, well, what is sarcoidosis? And, and when we hear about things like granulomas, um, what does that actually mean? Yeah, so, so Zia mentioned most of the important things already. We work together closely. We, we discuss those things quite a bit. But sarcoidosis, Chris, as, as Zia mentioned in you, is a disease that causes inflammation in the organs. And uh, more specifically, a type of inflammation caused by granulomas. And those granulomas are basically clusters of inflammatory cells. You know, those cells, they get together, they form this little cluster of cell. And when we look under the microscope, we call this granuloma. Uh, there's uh, some specific type of cells that uh, uh, form this granuloma. So macrophages or histiocytes, they are usually in the center of that granuloma. Some of the medications that we use, they try to target those cells. But around the granulomas, there are other types of uh, cells from our uh, immune system, lymphocytes, for example. So bottom line is a lot of cells from our immune system that get together, form this little cluster of, of cells. And uh, depending on where those granulomas are, patients will have different types of problems. Most of the time, as we mentioned already, those granulomas will affect the lungs. So 90 to 95% of the time, but any organ can be affected. And uh, you know, as we mentioned, uh, the heart is, is commonly uh, uh, one of them. So thinking about patients in two groups. So primarily the patients that I see are early on in the phase. They have relatively preserved cardiac function. We want to treat that inflammation up front so they don't have to come and see Zia down the line. So let's start with the initial treatment for treating the inflammation and have you, Manny, speak on that. And then I would love to have Ziad comment on uh, what he would add on for patients who have more significant cardiac dysfunction. And then I might make you guys talk about some cardiac imaging, which is obviously my passion. <laughs> so Manny, off you go. Yeah. Chris, you're absolutely right. So, so I like to say that time is muscle, right? We, we, we say this a lot in sarcoidosis in, in cardiology, and it's true for sarcoidosis as well. There is at least one study showing that the earlier that we treat, the better. And uh, the first step is to treat the inflammation. We have a lot of different medications that we can use, but the first line is really steroids, prednisone. Prednisone is very good in the beginning because it acts really fast and it decreases that inflammation in the heart. But we have to be careful because if we use only prednisone for many months or years, patients usually have a lot of side effects. So yes, for a few months, that's great, but we have to combine prednisone with something else very early on. 
Some centers like to do this a little bit later, maybe six months down the road. We here like to start those other medications from the very beginning, maybe in the first month of treatment, because you know this allows us to lower the dose of the prednisone and hopefully even stopping the prednisone a little sooner. So again, first line will be prednisone, steroids, then those other medications, the second line agents or the steroid spearing agents, some of the most famous ones are methotrexate or leflunamide. So those are medications that we like to use soon in the treatment for cardiac sarcoidosis. And then the last thing I'll say about this treatment of inflammation is sometimes we can't control the inflammation with those medications, steroids and, uh, and uh, methotrexate or leflunamide. So there is a stronger class of medication called TNF blocker. And we have a few medications in that category that we use. So those are stronger medications that we use to try to control inflammation when those initial drugs don't work. And that's, I think, been one of the advantages of us all working as a team, because a lot of those medications have side effects or have things that we need to monitor for. So to be able to do that in a coordinated way and make sure people don't get lost to the system has really been, I think, a big advantage. Um, Ziad, when patients present later or they uh, don't have a good response to infl inflammatory therapies and their cardiac function deteriorates, is the treatment that you give for sarcoid patients any different to the standard heart failure treatment? Um, and what does the standard treatment encompass? So patients may be on uh, a few different medications and would you mind just highlighting what some of the main classes are and uh, how can they can be a benefit? Correct, absolutely. Now, when sarcoidosis starts in the heart with a little bit of inflammation, it becomes unpredictable nature to see if it's gonna really progress to overt heart failure. So the faster patient goes on treatment, the better should be or would be the outcome. Once the inflammation goes on for so many years and heart started to remodel and get weaker, thinner and bigger, then there are two sides of this for treatment. Number one is sarcoidosis cardiomyopathy, just like any other dilated heart disease, we have to address the specific cause, which is the inflammation. But the other part is really to try to improve that scarring and prevent further damage from happening from the heart. The medications that we typically use are guideline-based medications that we use in other causes of heart failure as well. It includes uh, entresto or secubatrial valsartan, uh, losartan, lisinopril as one class of medications. The other class is beta blockers. Third class is aldosterone antagonist, and fourth class is SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, which we started using recently in, in those cases. And all these medications really tackle the heart from different angles to help with the scarring and the fibrosis. And like we discussed earlier, these medications most likely do work, and they, they do good job try to keep that heart controlled and at bay, but unfortunately in a very small population, the heart function continues to deteriorate. That's where heart pump and heart transplantations comes in handy. And we oftentimes get asked this question, will sarcoidosis come back in my heart after transplant? And the reality, it does. There are a few reports that it does come back, but after transplantation, Patients are on immunosuppression to actually preserve the heart function from ejection, and the same medicines would work to prevent sarcoidosis from coming back with vengeance. It might come in under the pathology, in the pathology samples, but usually it won't deteriorate the heart function. Thank you, Ziad. And I think that's been a wonderful overview. We've got so much to talk about. I think we might have to run this into a second session and perhaps I'll invite you to uh, come back and talk about my passion of cardiac imaging and also pacing and implantable defibrillators in the setting of cardiac sarcoidosis. So perhaps, guys, we can make this a series. But thank you for joining me today. Appreciate your insights and certainly highlighting the advantage to working in our multidisciplinary team. Uh, we certainly love to see any patients with cardiac sarcoidosis who feel that they want to seek an opinion or seek some expertise from a group such as ours where we really do strive to make sure that we uh, do this in a very thoughtful and a multidisciplinary manner. So thank you for joining us today. We hope that we'll see you again soon.